Chapter One. A gust of wind cut across Marcel's face as he cycled furiously down the street. He was riding as fast as he could and he pushed even harder on the pedals of his trusty blue bike. But the bumpy cobbles, cobblestones, cobblestone streets of Alcoin were not exactly made for speed. Still, he had to hurry. Just a little while ago, his mother had come into his tiny room with its narrow iron-framed bed, desk and old armoire crammed in the corner, demanding that he get up and run this errand for her. She said it was very important. Can't it wait, he had said. It's so cold out. It was late Sunday morning and he and his family were back from church. He was warm and cosy under a small blanket, reading an out-of-date magazine about the French-born René Vietto, the second-place winner of the 1939 Tour de France. No, she said, it can't. You have to bring this loaf of bread to Madame Trottier right now. Her tone was unusually stern. So, with a big sigh, Marcel set aside the magazine ran his fingers through the, his mop of curly hair, straightened his tortoise-shell glasses on his nose and reached for his jacket. He'd have to finish the article later. Ever since Marcel had gone with his cousins and his father to see the tour three years ago, he'd been practically obsessed with the big bicycle race and was looking forward to seeing it again. Riders from all over the world participated in the gruelling competition which was broken up into stages and went on for days. But in the spring of 1940, Germany invaded France and shortly after that, the German army marched into Paris. The Tour de France had been cancelled indefinitely. It was now 1942 and the occupation had dragged on for two long years. Who knew how long it would last or when the race would start up again? The bumpy cobblestones made the bike shake. But Marcel wouldn't let that stop him. He knew that in 1939, the spring classic Paris Roubaix bicycle race included 15 or more cobbled sections as part of the gruelling 200 plus kilometre course. There were even steep hills. He had just rounded the corner of the street where Madame Trottier lived a when suddenly a streak of orange flashed across the road. Zut alors! He jammed his feet on the brakes. He, he jammed his feet on the brakes hard and swerved just in time to miss hitting the very large ginger cat. The cat looked annoyed, but not especially alarmed. What a relief! He would have hated to be responsible for squashing a cat on the cobblestones. He liked cats. His parents kept a pair of tabbies in the bakery over which they lived because they were looking for good mousers. Sometimes when his mother wasn't looking, he would feed them scraps from his plate and they would lick his fingers with their rough pink tongues and purr almost too softly to hear. The ginger cat padded away unharmed, but a girl darted out into the street and scooped up the cat in her arms. She had blue eyes and black hair, plaited into two tight braids. Under her grey coat, she could see, he could see the hem of her dress, which was also blue. Bad kitty, she said. You could have been hurt. Is he OK? Marcel asked. He thought so, but he wanted to be sure. It's a she, said the girl. And she's fine, thanks. Still cradling the cat in her arms, she walked away. Marcel stood staring after her. He had never seen her before. Maybe she was new in town. She looked like she was around his age. And she was pretty. Not that he cared about stuff like that. He wasn't interested in girls. He thought they were bossy and gossiped too much. Also, they cried at the least provocation. And not one of them he knew had the slightest interest in what he considered to be the most important thing in life, cycling. But why was he even standing here thinking about this? He'd promised mother he'd hurry, and if he didn't, she would be annoyed. He loved his mum, but she did have a tendency to nag about cleaning up, 
washing his hair, helping out in the, back, in the bakery. Mums were like that. When he finally reached Madame Trottier's house, he'd been peddling so hard that despite the chilly day, he was sweating. Merci, she said, taking the bread from him. Tell your mother I appreciate it very much. I will, said Marcel. He peddled home more slowly, passing the string of shops that lined the street. Butcher, cheese store, greengrocer, cafe, and on the corner, bakery. On the other side of the street was a store that sold clothes, another that sold hats, and a third that sold toys. That used to be one of his favourite. But now that he was 12, he was a little too old to stop in any more. There was also a tailor, a tiny shop that sold used books, and the town's old church, St Vincent de Paul. He passed a few other people on the bicycles as well. Bicycles were just a part of life here and a good way of, to get around quickly. People young and old rode them almost everywhere. The only thing that was unfamiliar in all of this was the presence of soldiers. When the Germans had invaded France, they swarmed all over Paris and lots of other cities in the north. Marcel had seen headlines in the newspapers and heard about it on the radio that Papa kept on a table in the front room. Or coin, however, had been in the free zone since the invasion in 1940. And that meant it had not been occupied by Germans and they had not seen many soldiers here. But in the last two weeks, that had all changed. On November 11th, the Germans invaded the free zone too. And now soldiers from France and even Germany had started to appear in the town square or at the market. He also noticed more gendarmes, police, patrolling in the town. The French soldiers wore belted olive green jackets and helmets. In other circumstances, he might have admired them, but given the presence of the Germans and the gendarmes, they made his little village seem like a strange and scary place. A lot of other people thought so too and quietly cursed the soldiers when they were not in the earshot. People said that they were working hand in hand with the Germans and called them Calabos, which was short for collaborators. Whatever they were called, Marcel feared and distrusted them. He wished they would all go away. He slowed when he got to the bakery. His mother was outside, scanning the street for him. Did you deliver the bread? Yes, and Madame Trottier said to thank you. Only then did her expression soften. Good. Thank you for getting it to her. I'm going to keep riding for a while, he said. His mother nodded and went back into the bakery. She'd seemed so anxious lately, more, than, more so than usual. He wondered what was wrong, but when he'd ask, she'd say she was fine. The bicycle bumped along until Marcel reached the end of the cobblestones. Then he was able to pick up speed. Soon he was outside the town, pedalling faster and faster still. The houses rushed by and the trees arched overhead. Only a few dried leaves left on their tall branches. What if one day he could actually ride in the Tour de France? He'd be speeding along just like this. As he rode, the red-roofed houses gave way to farms and pastures in which he saw horses, cows, sheep and pigs. For a few seconds, he imagined the road lined not with animals, but with crowds of spectators cheering him on as he flew along to victory. Then he had to slow down for a gaggle of geese crossing the road, their noisy honks echoing in his ears as he passed. That ended his dreams of the Tour de France, at least for now. After a while, he grew hot and tired, so he let the bike slow to a stop and hopped off, flopping down on the dry grass. He would rest here for a few minutes before heading home. Marcel was small for his age, and not the best cyclist either, and he wore glasses. He didn't like being the smallest kid in the class, the one who got picked on and teased. He couldn't do anything about growing taller or needing glasses, 
Those things were beyond his control. But he could get stronger and faster. He could. That was why he vowed to try to ride every day, to build up his speed, his endurance and his strength. Then the other kids would think twice about teasing him. And that was what the Tour de France riders did. He'd been reading all about them. Most recently, the entire race course was 4,224 kilometres. You had to work up to a distance like that. Of course, the race was divided into stages of a certain number of kilometres each day to make it possible to finish. There were 18 stages in all. He also learned that cyclists had developed special strategies like eating certain foods and taking vitamins all in an effort to improve their performances. Marcel reached for his canteen, took a long drink and climbed back onto the bike. He still felt bitter about missing what was now three years of the race. It was another reason to resent the Germans. His parents shared his resentment. They detested the occupation, which had brought the soldiers here. It was also it also brought rationing and shortages of food and gas, and his parents especially detested Adolf Hitler, the leader of the German people, and the man responsible for the invasion and the war. But what could they do about it? Not a lot. As Marcel headed back toward town, he came to a small bridge where a French soldier stood patrolling. Under his helmet, his expression was stern. The gun slung over his shoulder looked big and heavy. Marcel slowed down the way he'd been taught. The soldier stepped out into the road and raised his hand. Marcel came to a full stop and waited while the soldier walked over and slowly looked him up and down. After a few seconds, he waved his hand, indicating Marcel could continue on his way. It was only when Marcel had gotten a little distance away that he realised he'd been holding his breath. Exhaling was a relief. 